Welcome to the 415 quadrillionth video on the internet regarding this game. Maybe. I haven't actually checked to see how many people are talking about this. Well, okay. I was watching this floor and exploring some caves on Hoxies who said this game was bad, but that was about the only thing I heard about this before playing it. Well, other than learning about its existence from some posts on various social media sites. Regardless, this is the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog. An April Fool's gag, a meme, whatever you want to call it, it was released for free on Steam a few days ago to rave reviews. And right off the bat, I gotta say that this is essentially a fan game that got Sega's blessing. At least, that's the vibe I got from it while playing. I know this wasn't a Sonic Mania situation where Sega paid some people within the Sonic fan game community to make an official Sonic game, and that much of the idea and development behind this came from Sonic's social media team. Yeah, there was no involvement from Sonic Team here, and this is not a typical Sonic game. You're not in an open world fighting some AI and her robot pals, you're not boosting through Greco-Roman style ruins or chemical plants or whatever, and you're in a visual novel, not a platformer. None of these comments are complaints, mind you. All that said, if you're only here to hear me give some general thoughts and opinions on the game and then leave, um, it's... Fine. Pretty good. Nothing special. It has its flaws. I realize some people within the Sonic fandom will chew me out for saying that, and or some comments I'll be dropping later on, but then again, the Sonic fandom's been chewing me out since the late 90s. I'm well used to that by now. But yeah, I really could just sum things up here by saying that for what it is, the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog is... fine. Despite the game being released around April Fools, it wasn't really meme -y, nor did it offer up bonkers commentary on how Sonic was killed by his own fandom or chippers or whatever. It told its own story and did what it needed to be engaging on its own merits. At this point, I should throw up some spoiler warnings for the rest of the video, so if you haven't played this yet and are interested in doing so, stop this video right now because I will be diving deep into the story in a few moments. Why not? It's a visual novel, and the story comprises a huge chunk of this game. Might as well go through it step by step and comment about other aspects of this game. But before I do, I should note that there is no voice acting for any of the characters present here. It's all text, and hey, that's good enough for me. So, it's Amy Rose's birthday, and she and her friends have decided to hop aboard a train called the Mirage Express to play out a murder mystery for her birthday party. Every single time I look at this thing, I cannot help but think of Tommy Oliver as the Red Ranger from Power Rangers Zeo. It's weird. Aside from inviting Sonic and Tails and Knuckles, we also have Blaze, Rouge, Vector, Espio, and everyone's favorite, Shadow. I wonder how she managed to invite him. Everyone's been given lore cards defining their characters for the murder mystery. Sonic's a ship's captain, Tails is a detective, Knuckles is a sheriff, Blaze is a, quote, titan of industry, Amy a journalist, Rouge a business tycoon, Vector a butcher, Espio a poet, and Shadow a locksmith. One of these people will be a murderer, and everyone else will be considered suspects. Given the game's title, it's obvious the person who will be murdered is... Mighty the Armadillo. Nah, I'm kidding. He's nowhere in this. Oh, by the way, you play as none of these characters. Well, aside from Sonic, but I'll explain that later. See this guy? That's who you play as. I'll refer to them as the player character from here on. It's also their first day on the job. Yep, first day on the job, and they get to cater to Sonic and all his friends. No pressure. We also have the train's conductor and, um, the train itself as characters. The latter manifesting as these robot arms that pop up throughout. Wonder who made those? Everyone in the murder mystery gets assigned to certain areas of the train, including a library that's two stories high. How big is this train exactly? There's also a casino, a saloon, Mirage Saloon? A lounge, a diner, and the conductor's car. Amy tells everyone the rules of the game and to mingle around for an hour to let the murderer do their thing. And then the train leaves the station rather violently. So violently, in fact, that Tails, Amy, and the player get thrown into the dining car's closet and are knocked out for a short time. It's here, in this closet, where the game truly begins. 
the closet door is blocked by a fallen shelf, and you gotta find your way out. Tails thinks Amy is hiding something since she woke up first, and he recruits the player to be his detective sidekick for the rest of the game. You start looking around for clues, clicking on everything from a random stick, to a trash can that is described as empty and yet looks pretty full and will become a reoccurring gag throughout the game, to the shelf itself. Wait, how did a crack on a shelf get added to the inventory? I don't know, maybe Tails brought along a notepad or something and jotted it down as part of the investigation. While I'm here, I guess I should talk about the inventory system for a bit. You always have a menu from the dining car, a map of the train which includes everyone's designated locations, and you get two or three pieces of evidence at each stage of the game. If you're expecting this to turn into Sonic the Hedgehog Ace Attorney, prepare to be disappointed. This has nowhere near the depth of an Ace Attorney game. Anyways, you gather enough clues to be able to talk to Amy, well, interrogate her about things like the shelf and its crack. You then get stumped on how to connect that piece of evidence to Amy and her actions. Tails asks you, what would Sonic do? And then... Oh boy, I gotta talk about these parts of the game now. The Think Segments. There are many games where you play as Sonic collecting a certain number of rings and avoiding hazards before reaching the end of a stage. Sonic himself moves at a constant speed, and all you can do is move him around and make him jump. If you succeed, you get a nice big floating light bulb that represents the next part of your argument. If you fail, the player character bumbles around for a bit before being forced to try again. For each interrogation, there's two or three of these, and after a while, these started dragging me down. I think my main problem with these is that they're too repetitive and wind up feeling more like filler than anything else. Sure, they get more difficult and introduce new hazards as the game goes on, but they don't really change that much. Well, not until the end of the game, at least. Also, if you are photosensitive or suffer from motion sickness, you might have a bad time with these segments because of what the graphics tend to be. Trippy backgrounds, rapidly flashing lights, especially in the later Think segments, and the game has no warnings regarding any of this stuff. Dare I say it, I also found them immersion breaking. Like, I gotta imagine the player character grabbing a Neo Geo pocket color, putting a cartridge labeled Sonic Pocket Adventure in, and playing that for two or three minutes while everyone around looks back in total confusion. Actually, the player character mentions at one point that they love playing endless runners on their phone, so maybe that's what's happening here. Still, my point stands. There are assist modes you can set in the options menu to make these easier, like making Sonic invulnerable or setting a low number of rings to collect, but you cannot outright skip any of these and let the story play on without them. I managed to get through the Think segments without messing with the assists, but I also had to replay a couple of them a bunch of times. Anyways, Tails and the player get Amy to admit that she brought her hammer with her, for some reason, and she used it to try bashing the shelf out of the way. It failed, hence the crack in the shelf. That random stick I mentioned earlier? That's the hammer's handle which broke off in the attempt. Tails fixes the hammer up, Amy bashes the shelf again, this time with success, and we're back in the dining car where... Oh. 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 Sonic is dead. And look at Amy, being all cute and excited at the sight of Sonic's dead body. Actually, as we'll find out later, he's not dead. He's just playing around, acting out being quote-unquote killed as part of the murder mystery. Right? Um, right? Sonic? Can you back me up here? Sonic? Hello? Maybe he's actually dead. Okay, time to go to the saloon. Find clues, talk to Knuckles, go through more Think segments, and get Knuckles to admit that he destroyed a Super Monkey Ball arcade cabinet after Vector bested Nux's high score. Tails somehow fixes the arcade cabinet, including a repair of what looks like a broken CRT. Okay. And we get a look at the high scores. Aside from Vector and Knuckles, there's one name that stands out. Ultim. Like, ultimate life form? As in Shadow? Why was he here playing this game? The answer? He knows how to play it. Knuckles and Vector didn't. He taught them how to play it 
before giving a key to Knuckles and leaving. So, Shadow's a hardcore gamer then. Huh, I knew it. Another piece of evidence in the saloon, lipstick on a cup, brings Rouge into the picture. Because of course Rouge is in the picture whenever Knuckles is around. She was there, searching for something that wasn't actually in the saloon, and left. Next, it's off to the library. Again, find clues, talk to Vector and Espio, go through more Think segments, get serenaded by Espio's poetry, wonder why there's a picture of Professor Pickle from Sonic Unleashed on the wall, and look out the windows to see if there's a flying purple unicorn with stars on her butt trying to break in. I should point out that Amy is here too, and that she has a special key that can open up any door on the train. Also, Shadow has been locking doors throughout the train. Huh. I feel you, buddy. Anyways, you start going through books, find Dr. Eggman's autobiography and recipe book, and find out that someone, Espio, has been reading the train's manual. You also decide to grab Shadow's lock off the door to the casino. During the interrogation, Vector admits he's a hardcore gamer too. Espio admits he did not see Shadow passing through the library. There's a map of the library you find in a brochure stand, and upon looking at it, you realize that there's a table surrounded by bookcases. That's where Espio was, busy reading the train's manual the whole time. Possibly. It's also revealed that Rouge was in the library too, where she apparently found something in the brochure stand and left. Tails admits that Espio's alibi isn't airtight, but he and the player accept it regardless. Now, off to the casino, where we find Blaze and Rouge. Rouge admits that she's looking for a treasure, the Fabergé Chow Egg, that's somewhere on board the train. Blaze admits that she got roped into this, and that the egg is somewhere in the casino, locked in a safe. The code to unlock the safe is on some blueprints for the train, aka the thing Rouge found in the library. The path to the safe goes up an elevator with a chow acting as a security guard in front of it, and why am I suddenly getting payday vibes? Tails and the player also get roped into Rouge's plots, and they help concoct a plan to get to the egg. Distract the guard, deal with the robot arms in the elevator, simple. By the way, there are no think segments here, and thank goodness, I needed that break. I get why there are so many think segments and why you cannot skip them, trust me, I'll get to that. But at the same time, I just cannot stop harping on them. I'm sorry. Like I said earlier, I didn't find them enjoyable after a while. That's why I love this part of the game, because of the lack of think segments. It's just you, Tails, Blaze, and Rouge sketching out the plan to steal the egg, executing said plan, going up to the safe room, and stealing the egg. Rouge tries to open the egg, the egg starts ticking like a bomb, but of course, it's not a bomb. It opens up, revealing a pendant that's a gem-encrusted chow. Job done, I suppose. Before you leave the casino, Blaze and Rouge say that Shadow also gave them a key. They unlock the door to the lounge, and you head through to find Shadow and Amy having a nice little chat about why Shadow's been locking doors throughout the train. Well, at least that's better than being called Master of the Microwaves or whatever. Shadow keeps saying that he has an appointment coming up and wants to be left alone. The game returns to finding clues, talking to Shadow and Amy, going through more Think segments, and watching the Big Chow Band perform. Searching for clues throughout the lounge results in the finding of a hidden passage back to the library. We also grab Shadow's keys from a bulletin board, again, Shadow's the locksmith, and that running gag about trash cans finally bears fruit. There's a crumpled up piece of paper within the one in the lounge, and unraveling it reveals the homepage of a website where you can order tickets for the band Hot Honey. At this point, everyone starts pointing fingers at Shadow as the murderer. Sonic was assigned to the conductor's car, and Amy says that Sonic being murdered so close to that position might have aroused suspicion. Shadow could have taken the hidden passage, dumped Sonic in the diner, and left. Shadow, of course, has his alibi. Hot Honey, as it turns out, is one of Amy's favorite bands. And interrogating Shadow reveals that unlike all the other guests, he did not bring any birthday presents for Amy. That appointment he keeps talking about? Shadow wanted to gift Amy tickets to see Hot Honey. And once those tickets become available, they're only available for a short time before they're all sold out. Him locking doors throughout the train? 
That was his way of keeping Amy away from him while he waited for tickets to become available. Of course, Amy has the special key, as I've already mentioned, so yeah. Amy also reveals that she, as a journalist, got a hot scoop from an anonymous source that seemed to pin Shadow as the murderer. Since Shadow's alibi wound up being airtight, well, he's not the murderer. I'll say that right now. He and Amy join Tails and the player as they proceed into the conductor's car, where there is no conductor. There is, however, a blow dart, the weapon used to murder Sonic, and a broken robot arm. Upon finding these items, Amy comes over the train's PA system to call everyone over to the conductor's car. Con considering the vent that's prominent in this room, you could say that this game just turned into Among Us. So everyone gathers in the conductor's car, but Sonic is not present. Amy and Vector go off to find him, and then we hear a scream. The two return with Sonic's lifeless body in Vector's arms, and Amy and Tails are mad. So, who did it? Who killed Sonic the Hedgehog? The answer may surprise you. It's Espio, the man whose alibi wasn't as airtight as the others. The man supposedly locked in the library, reading the user's manual for the train. The man who memorized that book to create an alibi for himself. The man who found the hidden passage from the library to the lounge from the blueprints. He found those before Rouge did. The man who... Oh, damn it, more think segments. But yeah, you get the point. Espio slipped into the conductor's car and struck down Sonic with a blow dart. That broken robot arm, though. Clearly, there was something more regarding what happened to Sonic outside of Espio shooting a blow dart at him. Knuckles finally checks out the vent and finds the tracks the arms use to move about the train. The possibility of Sonic getting carried to the diner by the arms after being hit by the blow dart is raised, and that Sonic could have broken one in a scuffle. Oh hey Sonic, about time you got back up, and I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. From here on, the story starts to fall apart a bit. You're probably thinking, wait, this is the end of the game, right? The murder mystery is over, Espio was the murderer, Sonic took the fall, we had our fun, and we can go home now, yeah? Nope! The game starts throwing twists at you! Twists like the train actually being a badnik built by Dr. Eggman. The train having a Flicky as a power source. The train kidnapping the conductor. Espio getting duped by Eggman to knock Sonic out. The train wanting the conductor to stay with it forever. The conductor being just a few days away from retirement. The train actually having a voice. <gasps> and breathe. So the train starts spinning off to Eggman's base so Eggman himself can turn Sonic and his friends into robots or whatever. Eggman contacts them, basically to taunt them. Typical Eggman stuff, in other words. Everyone gets separated again, the Think Mini game practically becomes the rest of the actual game, much to my chagrin. Everyone winds up back in the conductor's car, and then there's a final showdown between Sonic and his friends versus this train. The good guys win, the train stops back where it started, everyone gets off, Amy gets her birthday cake, the end. Well, okay, not really. We see the conductor's wife running up to greet him, and by the time this video goes live, she'll have hundreds, if not thousands, of images posted on, um, certain specific websites. At Dr. Eggman's base, we see Eggman, Metal Sonic, and Sage all waiting for that train to show up. Once everyone realizes that won't happen, Eggman has a fit, orders Orbot and Cubot to prepare a bath for him, the end. Well, okay, the player character tells you the story of the rest of his life or something, and then, the end. For reals this time. Well, that was an experience and a half. For a freebie April Fool's gag, the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog is, as I keep on saying, just fine. Pretty good. I really enjoyed the story to begin with, but then it kind of became... Eh, it's alright, by the time I got to the library. Things picked back up a bit when Rouge's heist took center stage before returning to It's Alright, then getting a little bumpy towards the end when everything became Destroy the Train, 
and when the Think Mini game turned into the actual game. Again, these are my views, and you're free to disagree with me on stuff like the Think segments. If you enjoyed those, or if you liked this game more than I did, that's great, and I don't want my negativity towards stuff like the Think segments to ruin that. I guess what I'm trying to say is... There was more good than bad here, and really? I cannot be too harsh on something like this. I might never return to this, or I might come back to this a few years from now, but still... Eh, I liked it. So, that was my look at the murder of Sonic the Hedgehog. If you enjoyed this, please consider doing all the typical supporting people on YouTube things. Subscribe to the channel, like this video, share it with your friends. Also, I have a Patreon, I have a coffee. you can throw money at them if you want. Links to those are in the video description. Take care of yourselves, and goodbye for now.